Good morning, everybody. Why don't we stand together? My name is Nicole Gossick, and I'm one of the worship leaders here at the Woods Church. Just want to welcome everybody who's here this morning. Uh, if you're online at home or wherever you are, we're so glad you're with us. Uh, we're going to go to a time of worship here in just a minute. But before we do, why don't we uh, go to a time of prayer? Dear God, we are here to worship you. We're here to glorify your name, to lift you high. God, we're here to lay down all distractions at your feet. God, would you just have our focus and just be glorified by our worship today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt This is the second week of our Advent season. It's a time of preparation and waiting uh, for the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior. I'm going to read out of Matthew. It says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And maybe we've heard that before, but God with us. We hear that all the time around Christmas, but think about it. God is with us. God sent his son, the king of kings, to bring hope and bring light, knowing far too well that apart from him, we would do nothing. He came to give us life and, and, and hope and, and joy. 
So if you're needing to restore that joy this morning, why don't you join me and continue to sing of our Lord and Savior as we sing his name, Emmanuel, God with us.
as we sing our praises this morning to God. I'm reminded that so many of us have walked in this room carrying some heavy bags, heavy hearted, painful situations, unknown circumstances. Yet I'm reminded that regardless of what life throws our way, we still have a God who loves us, a God that we can turn back and give our praises to because he is ever present with us. I'm reminded of Paul's words to the Roman church when he says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whew. What a powerful truth to hang on to this morning. An incredible promise of God. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning in prayer, God, we are overwhelmed by the promise found in Paul's words. That your love for us has, is not dependent upon our circumstances in this life. And the things that we go through when we walk through the valleys and the wilderness, when we are in the trial or in the struggle, that doesn't negate your love for us. God, no, you actually come and you meet us in our pain. You meet us in our hurt. You meet us in the fear and the anxiety of the unknown. And you never let us go. God, when we sing about Emmanuel, God with us, how can we not be awed by what you did? You left the throne room of heaven and came to earth as a baby born in a, in a dirty and filthy stable of parents who didn't matter to anybody. Yet you were the savior of the world, sent here to ultimately walk to a cross where you would be brutalized so that you could pay our penalty for sin because you love us so much. God, our brains cannot fathom that kind of love, but we are so, so grateful for it. And God, I'm reminded this morning that as we walked into this place, so many of us came in heavy hearted. And God, I just pray that whatever the burdens of our hearts are, that we would lay them at your feet this morning. That we wouldn't allow the enemy to distract us from being focused on you. Would you breathe new life? Would you give us a fresh touch from you today, God? This morning as we were praying, I thought about that worship song that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim and the light of his glory and his grace. God, that's what we want this morning. We want the things of this earth to grow dim so we can focus solely on your glory and your grace. So Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do. Give Pastor John a fresh anointing to speak your truth and to pierce our hearts. God, would you meet us right where we're at? And would we lay everything down at the feet of our Savior? And God, then we will give you all the praise and all the glory for what you are about to do here in this moment. Because you are good and you are here and you have an everlasting love. And so we love you, and we give you our praise and our worship because only you are worthy of it. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray, amen. Would you please be seated? You know, scripture tells us, Jesus says in uh, the gospel writer, Matthew records in his gospel that Jesus says that we are to store our treasures up in heaven 
rather than storing them up here on earth where they will fade and, and rot, but that we should store our treasures in heaven where it has eternal value. Yet at Christmas time, all of us, or most of us, are going to run around like crazy chickens with our heads cut off looking for the perfect gift for those we love. That perfect object that's going to bring them a moment of joy. But this Christmas, instead of giving the people we love most an object that's going to bring them a moment of happiness that will fade as quickly as it came, what if we gave a gift that has an eternal impact? What if we gave gifts that position people to experience the power and the presence of God? And we have two incredible opportunities, two incredible ways that you can do just that. And the first opportunity is our Leland Night of Worship that's going to happen at the end of January. And our second opportunity is the Stronger Men's Conference that will happen at the end of February. These are, there, are, there is no greater gift. You will not go to a store and find a greater gift than positioning people to experience the power and the presence of God. And so that, those tickets for both of those events can be purchased on our Church Center app. The Leland uh, Night of Worship, those tickets are just $20, and this event is for everybody. Anybody on your Christmas list, you can buy that for. Whether they are a teenager or an adult or a senior, it doesn't matter. It is going to be an incredible night for everybody to gather and worship God. And the tickets for the Stronger Men's Conference, the early bird prices are in effect right now. And you can get those also on our Church Center app. And what an incredible gift to get any guy on your Christmas list. So often we struggle to figure out what to get. But can you imagine getting your dads, your uncles, your brothers, your nephews, your sons, who, whatever guy it is that you love getting them that gift so they can come into this place and worship with other men and lift up the name of Jesus and for some of them, experience God for the very first time. Like there's nothing better than those kind of gifts because they have eternal value. You know, another great way that you can experience the supernatural love of God and his presence this Christmas season is through our Supernatural Love Campaign. We have the incredible uh, opportunity to host McCrest starting the week of December 15th. And what an honor and a privilege it is to serve these women and these children and to truly show them the supernatural power of God's love. And there are a multitude of volunteer opportunities still open for McCrest. We're looking for drivers. We're looking for child care. We're looking for people who will just come out and hang out with our guests and just love on them and serve them. So if you are interested in serving at McCrest, you can sign up on the Church Center app. Or we have representatives at the McCrest display in the lobby this morning, and they can get you signed up immediately this morning. And finally, another great opportunity to experience the presence of God will be at our Christmas Eve services. We will be having Christmas Eve service right here in our sanctuary for at 3 o'clock and at 5 o'clock. And I know so many of you have traditions that you do with your family and you gather with friends. And I want to encourage you, invite them to come to service with you so that you can gather and worship the birth of our Savior with those you love the most. And at this time, the ushers are going to come forward, and we are going to prepare to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. And if you're a guest with us this morning, this is simply a time in our service where we give back to God just a portion of what he has so generously blessed us with. You know, when I was, as I was preparing for this morning, I was reminded that so often we think worship is just about coming into this building one day a week and singing some songs to God. But really, worship is a lifestyle. It's about how we choose to live our lives every day of the week. And when you choose to give generously from your financial resources, you are worshiping God. Because what you're saying is, God, I recognize that everything I have is actually from you. It is not mine. It is because you have so blessed me. And when you give generously, what you're saying is, God, I want to partner with what you are doing in the world and because so many of you are generous with your giving, you fuel our ability to do ministry here. 
It is because of your generosity that we can host things like McCrest. That we can create environments that position people to experience God's presence like the Leland Night of Worship and the Overflow Conference and the Stronger Men's Conference. That is because of your generosity. And so we just wanted to take a moment this morning and say thank you. Thank you for partnering with us and worshiping God through your finances. Because together, we will make the name of Jesus known and advance the kingdom of God. And as the ushers pass the buckets this morning, let's prepare our hearts for Pastor John's message. One. Yeah. Hey. Welcome back. Uh, John Nick even asked me in the back, is Jamaica? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I flipped the switch. I'm on. Forgot to turn the power on. All right. Did you guys hear all that? That was a good setup. <laughs> oh, man. Well, anyway, we get distracted easily, right? Last week was all about letting go of stuff. This week's going to be about letting go of distraction. I believe God's got some powerful things he wants to speak to us today about this idea. And uh, we really want to talk about letting go of the mental clutter, right? In fact, it's really, really hard for us to focus sometimes in the speed of life. Life is fast paced. There's a lot happening. And man, it's really hard for us to focus sometimes. And how many of you find it hard to focus? So there's seasons in life, maybe certain weeks, maybe certain days. It's just hard. It's hard to focus. How many of you have had a hard time focusing on my messages before? Yeah. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Come on. Man. Right? It's easy. It's easy for us to allow our minds to wander. So even in our context this morning, it, 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 we can get distracted very, very easily. You know, what are we going to have for lunch today? Man, I'm hungry. My stomach's growling. What are we going to have for lunch? I wonder how my kid's doing downstairs. I wonder if they're okay, if they're having fun. Oh, I can't forget to do that, that today. I got to do that today. I can't be tomorrow. I got to take care of that today. Oh, what's that person doing over there? You know, <laughs> man, it's really easy for us to get distracted. Pastor John, man, I must say, you are looking good today. <laughs> Now, the only reason I use that one is because I was at a nursing home 
<laughs> I was at a nursing home the other day, and I'm, I'm there seeing uh, uh, one of our, one of our uh, people's moms in the nursing home. And the nurse walks in, and she introduces me as her son's pastor. She's like, this is my son's pastor here. And the nurse goes, what? This is your pastor? How do you even pay attention on Sunday mornings? <laughs> I think I turned three shades of red. I'm like, I didn't even know what to say, and I'm very rarely ever left speechless. And I was just like, thank you? Trying to move on, you know, change the subject real quick. So, listen, it's so easy, right? It's so easy to let your mind wander. It's hard to focus at times. But let me tell you, it's absolutely, and it's completely worth the fight. So today we're going to be talking about letting go of the distractions that can destroy us. Church, do you realize that your spiritual enemy, every, every force of hell is trying to distract you from living for the things that matter most? Everything, right? Our enemy and every one of his demonic forces wants to pull you away, wants to divide your mind, wants to discourage your soul, wants to disengage your faith and distract you from the things that matter most. In fact, the devil doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. Now, if he can distract you, eventually he's going to neutralize you, or worse, you'll end up destroying yourself. See, we have to let go of the distractions that destroy. Now, there's a powerful passage in Scripture that really speaks to this idea of distraction. In fact, I've, I, I feel that God over the past six months has brought this passage of scripture back to me again and again, and he's taught me a ton out of this passage. It's found in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, and it's the story of Mary and Martha. How many of you remember about a month ago when I was teaching out of this story? No, you don't. You don't remember that. Come on. Right? No, we're, I, I've taught from this story a couple times. You know, Nikki's taught from it a couple times. But, man, I just feel like there's continual God brings revelation and life to me through this story. So I've usually taught from this story. I've usually taught from Mary's perspective. You know, Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. But I really, I, I, I really uh, want to teach from Martha's perspective today. So as we read this passage of Scripture, I want you to think about Martha. I want you to think about what she's doing what she's feeling, what she's sensing. Why is she doing what she's doing? Like, let's, let's, let's read this. Luke chapter 10, 38 through 42. As Jesus and, his, and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat, everybody say sat. Sat, sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted. Everybody say Distracted. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. Now, I spoke many times, like I said, about Mary, how she sat at the Lord's feet. And if you remember that word sat, this is the only place that that word is found in the entire New Testament. And the Greek word for that word sat is parakathidzo, right? This is the only place it's found, and it literally means to sit against Jesus, to lean against him. That's how close Mary was. Man, she was hanging on to every word that came from his mouth. She was focused on what Jesus was speaking. She listened intently. I mean, she could feel as she sat there leaning against him, she could feel just life flowing through her, right? Because life is always found in his voice. Remember that, church. Life is always found in his voice. So Mary was in close proximity to Jesus. She had positioned herself to hear his voice. But Martha, Martha was a different story. Scripture says that Martha was distracted. She was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And honestly, I don't blame her. Jesus is in her house. If Jesus came to your house, you might be distracted too, right? She wants everything to be just right. 
And I can imagine that her anxiety was probably a little high that day. I mean, she was feeling some pressure. Maybe she was even feeling overwhelmed. I mean, she has taken the green bean casserole out of the oven. And she's trying to put the apple cobbler in. And she's making sure that the turkey is cooked all the way through and that it's seasoned just right. And she's making sure that, 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 that she's, got, she's got bread ready and, and, and the sweet tea. Jesus' glass of sweet tea is filled and, and refilled and that, and that he's got what he needs, right? She makes sure that the toilet paper in her bathroom matches the shower curtain because that's really important. She just wants to make a good impression, right? She wants to be a good host, but she's running around in circles. She's distracted by all the preparations. And it's this word distracted that scripture uses to describe Martha. The Greek word for distracted is perispau. That's how you say it, Paris Pal. It's kind of fun to say. You guys want to say it? Say Paris Pal. The word means to drag around, to be driven in circles, or to drag away. Jesus was sitting in the living room dispensing words of life. And I mean, when Jesus spoke, incredible things happened, didn't they? I mean, when Jesus spoke, diseases were healed and demons fled and water transformed into wine and raging storms ceased and ears were opened and eyes saw and mouths spoke and life-transforming words were given that shifted people's eternities. I mean, man, when Jesus spoke, right? Why? Because life is in his voice. Life is in his voice. And Mary sat there. She sat there pressed against Jesus, pressed against his legs, just hanging on to every life-giving word that was spoken. While Martha, Martha was driven and dragged around in circles. In fact, listen, Martha was distracted even in his presence. Think about that. You ever see that in the story? Martha was distracted even in his presence. Right? Martha wasn't far away from Jesus. The homes back then weren't very big. Martha was probably only 15 or 20 feet away from Jesus at any given time. Yet Jesus stated that Martha was worried and upset over a lot of details that didn't matter. Now, I think Martha gets a bad rap sometimes. Because Martha is getting all the work done. I mean, I thank God for people like Martha. Right? It's because of people like Martha that you're going to eat tonight. Right? That your bills are going to get paid this month. That your business is going to flourish. That your company is going to grow. And that those crazy details, all those crazy details are going to be taken care of. That's because of Martha's that, that you will have presents under the tree this year. Because they made a list and they spent time shopping and they found all the deals. And they put a lot of time and they put effort into it. I mean, can you imagine if Mary's ran the world? We'd be living the Caribbean life, right? If Mary was running the world, you would go hungry tonight. You would go home. You would go to a home with no heat, right? There would be no presents under the tree for you this year. Your, your business portfolio would be a mess, and, and your books would be a disaster. I think Martha's get a bad rap sometimes. Yet there's a whole lot of truth that we can learn from what Martha did wrong. You know, Martha comes out of the kitchen, right? She is all fired up. I mean, she's hot. She's livid, right? Because Martha thinks Mary is being lazy. I mean, come on, every family has one, right? Every family has one. When you have family gatherings, there is always one who doesn't bring a dish to pass, but they will bring several Tupperware containers so they can stuff them and pack them full and take it home, take the leftovers home with them, right? How many of you have someone like that? If you're not raising your hand, it might be you, right? Martha comes out of the kitchen. She's steaming, right? She gives Mary a stern look. And then proceeds to complain to Jesus, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister <laughs> just sits there while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. And Jesus has this 
this very unusual response to Martha. He, he answers her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted about many things, but really there is only one thing that matters, and Mary has discovered it. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Martha, Martha, you have a good heart. You have good intentions, but honey, you are distracted. Everybody say distracted. My phone just dinged. I just got an email. Oh, someone just posted a cat video, right? Oh, I have to check my social media, my Facebook, my Twitter, my Instagram, my Snapchat, my, my, my Slack, my Game Changer, my fantasy football, and the list goes on and on. And oh, I want to see how many likes I got from that picture I posted five seconds ago. And oh, and oh, do we, do we have some, wait, we have some Christmas shopping to do today. And I got to get to the grocery store and the kids have to get to baseball practice and soccer practice and hockey practice and basketball practice and dance practice and euchre practice. And, and we have to get some food. We have to get some food in them because they haven't eaten yet. And we have lots of errands to run and a lot of places to go and a lot of things to do. And oh, my friend wants to have coffee with me today. And oh, look, another cat video posted. Martha, Martha. Mary has chosen what is most valuable. Do you see, she wasn't doing something bad. Martha wasn't doing bad things. She wasn't doing something wrong. What she was doing was probably good, but she wasn't doing what was best. See, every day we have to recognize that our most difficult choices are not between good and bad, but between good and best. And listen, if the enemy can't make you bad, if he can't cause you to sin, then he will just distract you away from using your life for the things that truly honor God and make an eternal difference. Right? This is one of, this is one of his main tactics. This is one of his main strategies. If he can't destroy you, he will distract you. And distracting you is just as good to him. Right, Every demonic force in hell wants to distract you away from sitting at the feet of Jesus. Because if he succeeds, he will be victorious by keeping you from using your life to advance God's kingdom here on the earth. I want to give you three thoughts this morning that I think will help us focus on what really matters. Not just throughout this Christmas season, but maybe throughout 2020. Here's three, three thoughts. Number one. I have to diminish the distractions. I have to diminish the distractions. In Matthew chapter 14, you will find the story of Peter being called out of the boat to walk on the water towards Jesus. Many of you have probably read that story before. There's this great storm that's happening. The waves are big. The wind is blowing. The disciples thought their boat was going to sink. They thought they were all going to drown. They're scared. They're fearful. They don't know what they're going to do. Then they see this figure coming towards them, walking on the water. They're scared. They're fearful because they think it's a ghost. But Jesus calls out to them, right? He calls. I says, no, it's me. Take courage. I am here. And then Peter, Peter doesn't really believe that because Peter never really believes anything the first time. And Peter shouts back, man, if it's really you, then call me to come out of the boat and walk on water toward you. So Jesus did. The incredible thing about this story is that Peter actually had the courage to get out of the boat and walk towards Jesus. I mean, have you ever walked on water? That's pretty big, right? This is a big deal. But when Peter was almost to Jesus, his focus shifted from Jesus to the wind and to the waves around him, and he got distracted. And something bad happened when he got distracted, when he took his eyes off of Jesus. Do you know what it was? He began to sink. You see, the same scenario happens to all of us today, right? When we get distracted, when we take our eyes off of Jesus, it robs us from his voice. And remember, church, life is found in his voice. It's found in hearing God. When we get distracted from his presence, we get robbed. And I mean, how can we operate in the power of the Holy Spirit out in the world every day if we're running around in circles, if we're distracted by the cares of life, right, being dragged away from his voice? How will, how will we as a body of believers ever function in the supernatural if we are always finding ourselves overwhelmed by the natural? 
We have to realize that the most important thing, the most important thing we can do each day is position ourselves like Mary and hang on to every life-giving word that Jesus speaks. See, listen, when we are distracted, we will make good decisions, but we won't make God decisions. When we're distracted, our lives will be filled with activity, but we won't accomplish anything. When we're distracted, man, we will get exhausted quickly, and in that exhausted state, we will fail to worship. When we get distracted, distraction causes burnout to come easily, and we will find ourselves discouraged and unpassionate about life. When we get distracted, we may, we may do things for Jesus, but we will fail to do things from Jesus. That means there will be no lasting fruit. When we get distracted, we may be alive, but we will fail to truly live. Even when serving in ministry, even when serving in the church, man, if we're living in distraction, our activities will lack any power to create any type of life change in the people around us. So we have to diminish the distractions, and we have to live intentionally, right? Meaning that we need, to, we need to treat anything that might distract us, we need to treat it like sin. We may need to reprioritize what's really important to us. Today in our culture, the Trinity consists of God, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the mobile phone. That's our Trinity, Right? It's that little device, that little device, although it can do so, so much good, can also become one of life's greatest distractions. Right? It's been around and it's been available to everyone for about two decades now, but for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, we lived without it. But today, we can't leave home without it. Right? The fact is, the average person checks their cell phone every 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes. If you wonder why you're not productive, wonder no more. If you wonder why your relationships aren't as intimate as they should be, if, if you wonder why you're not as close to God as you would like to be, if you wonder why you can't seem to do anything meaningful, then it might have to do with you being interrupted every 10 minutes. I mean, Holly and I went on a date the other night, and we've been trying to go on a date for the last couple weeks, and finally found a night to go. And we're walking out of the movie, and, and one of my buddies texted me, and I simply pulled my phone out to text yes, three letters, yes, and I got in trouble. <laughs> I got in trouble because I wasn't focused on her, and I wasn't focused on the conversation, and I wasn't focused on the date. I wasn't present, all right? How many times do we run through our days and run through our lives and through our conversations and through our relationships and we're not present because our mind is always distracted or someplace else? It happens all the time. I didn't get in trouble because it happened one time. I got in trouble because it happens a lot, right? And I'm assuming it happens to you as well. This statistic blows me away. Did you know that the average person spends two hours a day on social media. The average person spends two hours a day. I check mine about once every three to five days. <laughs> I just, so if I don't like something that you posted or I don't respond, it's not, it's not because I don't like you. It's because I didn't see it because I, I didn't check my social media. Right? If you're a teenager and you spend two hours a day on social media, you will spend an average, right? Are you ready for this? You will spend an average of seven years of your life on social media. Seven years of your pathetic life, <laughs> scrolling, tapping, scrolling, tapping, <clears throat> looking at comments, sending emojis, seven years, seven years of feeling left out, wondering why your friend hasn't liked your photo, seven years comparing your likes to other people's likes, seven years of keeping track and counting the friends you have on social media which most of them really don't care about you at all. You, know, you want to talk about a distraction that will bring destruction and death. I mean, the enemy has us right where he wants us. Diminish the distractions. Don't waste your life on things that don't matter. Right? Put the phone down. Cancel some of your social media. Put limits on it. Put limits on whatever else might be distracting you in life. It's not that distractions are bad. It's not that those things are bad in and of themselves, but when they distract us away from what's really important, that's the problem. 
<clears throat> so number one, <clears throat> diminish the distractions. Number two, the second thing that I have to do is I have to focus on what's important. Diminish the distractions and then focus on what's important. I love Proverbs chapter 4, verses 23 through 27. Let me read it to you. It'll be on the screens. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk and stay away from corrupt speech. I love this. Listen to verse 25. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet and then stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. There's a lot of personal intentionality in this passage, right? Guard your heart for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart from distraction. Determine what the most important things are in your life and then focus your life around those few things, right? Don't just focus your life around them, but actually lay out a clear path, a clear and intentional path for those things, right? If one of those things is your family, which it should be, don't just expect everything to go well. Don't just expect your kids to grow up and be okay. Don't just expect your, that your marriage is going to be strong because none of that's going to happen if you're not being intentional to make it happen, right? What does each day look like? How am I going to pour into my kids this week? How am I going to raise them up in the way that they should go? How am I going to teach them to recognize God's voice this week? You think about, how am I going to teach my kids to hear the voice of God this week? How am I going to teach them to make choices that are going to honor God and honor the people around them? You know, what am I going to do this week to pour my life into my marriage? What am I going to do to serve my spouse? How am I going to lead my spouse to the cross to meet with Jesus this week? I mean, if you sit back and you just let life happen, right? If you just let the cards fall where they will, you're basically giving the enemy the keys to your life the keys to your marriage, the keys to your home, and the keys to your kids. We have to live intentionally. You have to mark out a straight path for your feet, right? And you got to keep your eyes glued on that straight path, and you got to keep centered on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your life. This is the only way to stay focused on the things that are really important, right? If you don't do this, you're going to be robbed. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He isn't stopping, right? He doesn't rest. He doesn't take a break. He doesn't slow down. His hatred for God and for you never sleeps. That's why we must stay close to Jesus. We must lean into every word that comes from his lips, every life-giving word, and we've got to live intentionally. Martha, Martha, do you know how much I love you? but you are so freaked out about so many things that really don't matter that much. Only a few things are important. Therefore, I'm going to distance myself from distractions, right? So number one, diminish the distractions. Number two, stay focused on what's important. And here's number three. I'm going to position myself to listen, hear, and obey the voice of God. I'm going to position myself to listen, hear, and obey the voice of God. I want to read Isaiah chapter 30, verses 20 through 22. Powerful. Though the Lord gave you adversity for food and suffering for drink, he will still be with you to teach you. You will see your teacher with your own eyes. Your own ears will hear him. And then listen to this. This is, this is so cool. I love this part. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go whether to the right or to the left. Then you will destroy all your silver idols and your precious gold images. You will throw them out like filthy rags, saying to them, good riddance. Good riddance to all those distractions. Right? Those are distractions in this passage of Scripture. There are things that are taking your time and your attention and your worship away from the Lord. Good riddance. We're getting rid of those distractions. I'm throwing them out. I'm going to position myself to hear the voice that tells me where to step and when to step and which direction to go. In the story of Mary and Martha, when Jesus was responding to Martha's request to have Mary come and help her, Jesus said, there is only one thing worth being concerned about, 
And Mary has discovered it. Remember the parable? It's one of my favorite parables. It's the parable found in Matthew 13, 44. It's the parable of the hidden treasure. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. It's really talking about the relationship with Christ, the relationship. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy that field. What did the man do when he discovered this priceless treasure? He sold everything. He got rid of every distraction in his life because nothing is greater and nothing should be more valuable than this relationship, this treasure that he found in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, people do not live on bread alone, but on every what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, there's no word in this passage that describes what comes from God's mouth. So when Jesus quotes this passage, which is originally found in Deuteronomy back in the Old Testament, for referring to what proceeds out of God's mouth, he uses the word, the Greek word, rhema. He says, people do not live by bread alone, but on every rhema that comes from the mouth of God. The word rhema means something uttered that is living, a living voice, a voice filled with life. We're living on the voice that is filled with life. Right? Every word that Jesus speaks is filled with life. Anything uttered out of God's mouth is something that we can live on. And it's these words that bring life. And it's these words that change destinies and eternities and heal bodies and deliver the oppressed and bring people into encounters with the living God. God's words are words filled with supernatural life. Have you heard his voice lately? Have you heard the words from his lips lately? Or have you been distracted? Like Mary, if we will get rid of all the distractions and position ourselves and sit at Jesus' feet daily and lean into him, and hang on to every word that comes from his lips, we too will find life. I want you just to bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. <laughs> bow your heads, close your eyes. I want to ask you a couple questions, and I want you just to have a time between you and the Lord this morning. Just time between you and God. Where do your priorities need to change? Are there some priorities in your life that you need to put in place? Are there some priorities you need to rearrange, change? What are your priorities? I, want, I need you to think about it. Just you and the Lord. What are your priorities? I'm going to give you a minute. I'm not talking about what you think your priorities are or what your what you think your priorities should be. I'm talking about what are your priorities right now? Dictated by your time, by your attention, by your focus, by your checkbook, all those things. What are your priorities right now? Now I want you to ask yourself this question. Where do I need to make changes? What distractions do I need to throw out of my life? Where do I need to make changes? And what distractions do I need to throw out of my life? What's keeping me from intentionally laying out a path for my family, for my marriage, for my kids? What's keeping me from that? What's taking up too much of my time? And I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about good things. These things are good in and of themselves. But when there's too much attention paid to them, it begins to rob us of our relationship with God. It robs us of life-giving words. What is that? Where do we need to make changes? What distractions do you need to get rid of? The title is Letting Go 
of the sermon today is letting go of distractions. But man, when it comes to this, you got to be forceful. You got to be violent. You can't just let them go or they're going to come back. You got to bury them. You got to have a little violence towards them. A little hatred, a little anger. Like this is not going to distract me. This is not going to steal my time from my kids or my family or my God. What is it? What have you allowed to become a distraction? And when God speaks to you and he reveals that to you, just repent of those things. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. And then begin to think about, well, how am I going to change this? Because God will forgive you. There's there's no issues there. We know that. God's going to forgive you. But you're going to be have to be intentional to make some of those changes. What are they? What do you need to do? What does it look like this week in your life? What does it look like to prioritize sitting at Jesus' feet this week? Does it mean getting up? You know, a half hour, 45 minutes earlier and just spending some time with him? Spending some time in prayer, listening, hearing, reading his word, reading through the Psalms? circling his promises, underlining those promises, allowing those promises to speak to you? What does it look like to draw closer to God this week? To set your priorities straight. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. I'm so thankful that we serve such a patient God because sometimes, Father, we run this fast-paced life and, God, we get so distracted, we don't even realize it at times how distracted we have become. So, God, I just pray right now that you will forgive us. We bring these distractions to you and we say, God, we don't want these distractions in our lives. And it's not that these distractions are bad. They're just not what's best. So, God, help me to rearrange my life, to put things in the priorities you would want them. Help me to be intentional to live my life for impact and to make a difference, a real difference in the lives of my family, in the lives of my church, in the lives of my coworkers, in the lives of the people I meet each and every day? How can I be the light of Christ? How can I know your heart and walk with you each and every day? Teach me to depend upon you and have faith to be obedient, to step out, to keep me on the straight path. I don't want to get distracted and, and, and veer off the path. So God, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you like Peter trusted you as he got out of the boat and walked on water. I'm trusting you with my life. I'm trusting you that you will show me as I reprioritize, as I spend time with you. You'll show me which way to go and how I should live. We ask this and we pray this in your holy and precious name. And God's church said, amen. 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 If you're visiting with us today, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so thankful that you came and chose to spend a little time with us. Please stop by Guest Central. We'd love to meet you and just get to hear a little bit about you. As you go today, oh, before I do the commission, we always have a prayer team up here as well. You guys know that, but I always want to announce it. If you've got a prayer need, you need someone to pray with you, our prayer team will be right up here up front. They'd love to pray with you. As you go today, may you passionately pursue God. May you relentlessly reveal Jesus to the world, and may you not get distracted. Have a great morning.